We want to welcome all of you to this service of worship from the Chapel Without Walls for Sunday, May 17th. I want to say that we are hopeful that soon we will be able to hold our services in the Island Recreation Center. We will not do that, obviously, until the governor or the mayor say that it is okay for churches to resume services. But when that happens, we no doubt will go first to the Island Recreation Center because we're quite convinced that we will not be able to go back to the Cypress where we normally hold our services. They will be uh, not open to outside groups uh, l for a longer time, I'm sure, in the Island Recreation Center. But we will let you know uh, by email or phone call when we will have our first service in the Recreation Center. Let us now worship God. In worship, we see the glory and the majesty of God, in music, in scripture, and in spoken words. But we also perceive the power of God in a distinctly minor key, in brief silence, in minuscule snatches of fleeting words, in a still small voice we recognize, often only in retrospect, as the voice of God. God comes to us both in power and in weakness, and only the eyes of faith can recognize him in both guises. Therefore, let us, with all the faith and confidence we can muster, worship God. Our first reading this morning is taken from the book of Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Let us listen for the word of God. My son, if you have become a surety for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are snared in the utterance of your lips, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself, for you have come into your neighbor's power. Go, hasten and importune your neighbor, give your eyes no sleep, and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her food in summer and gathers her sustenance in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, and poverty will come upon you like a vagabond and want like an armed man. Amen. Let us pray. Who is like thee, O God? Who in heaven or on earth is like thee? 
from nothing thou hast created the ever-expanding universe, and we can scarcely imagine how many stars there are with how many planets similar to ours where others such as ourselves may live and may, at this moment, also be worshipping their Creator. We marvel at the incredible intricacy of the earthly order and how nature reflects thy purposes and intentions in wonderfully complex patterns and organisms. But as we pray thee for thy majesty of thy, thy creation, we also implore thine assistance to help us be worthy stewards of the world and all its bounties. Individually, we may attempt to do our best, but collectively, we have no choice but to admit that we are bringing ecological disaster upon this fragile planet, because it is primarily through national and international actions and through corporations admitting the damage we are creating. We pray thee to move among governments and parliaments, through major organizations and in corporate boardrooms, that people of power may use their power for the good of all succeeding generations, and not just for the narrow bottom line self-interest which so often characterizes humanity's political and economic decisions. Above all, help us to feel a sense of responsibility to help prepare the best future possible for the most possible people. We pray for people who are dying, old people who know their lives are rapidly slipping away and who either do or do not accept and affirm that reality. Middle-aged people who long have fought illness or who rather suddenly are faced with health crises which shall spirit them away from this earth. Young adults or youth or children who are gripped by diseases which are robbing them of life and who wonder how that can possibly be happening to them. Most especially do we pray for people who have been infected by the coronavirus and in particular for those who shall die from it. Lord God, we do not understand how or why many things occur in the lives of each of us and of all of us. In the midst of our perplexity, we ask for faith to accept that which we cannot comprehend, trust to suppose that even in adversity and sorrow thou art there, and affirmation to believe that thy grace is sufficient for all things. We offer these prayers in the name of him who has drawn us into thy presence, Jesus Christ, whom we also recognize as Lord. We pray in thy name and also in the name of Jesus. Amen. In a few moments, you're going to be hearing the partita in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. It will be played by Isabella Gorman, who is the granddaughter of Chalmers and Sonia Gorman. Chalmers is our primary soloist in the chapel without wall. Isabella is a freshman at the New England Conservatory in Boston. She also has uh, participated in the Virginia Fiddlers competition. This is something that is held each year and it is very rapid music that came to the Appalachian Mountains from Scotland and Northern Ireland and from the Scotch-Irish and the Scots. We're delighted that Isabella can be part of our ser service on this Sunday morning.
And now let me read to you the second reading, which is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. In this portion of Scripture, Paul is speaking about himself, but for some reason he does so in the third person. Listen to these words. I must boast, there is nothing to be gained by it, but I will go on with visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man who, 14 years ago, was caught up into the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. Though if I wish to boast, I shall not be a fool, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given to me in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will also the more gladly boast of my weaknesses, that the power of God may rest in me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. May the Lord bless to us these readings from His Holy Word, and to His name be the glory and the praise. The text for the sermon is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where Paul wrote, but God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The theme for the sermon this morning is the power of weakness, the weakness of power. It is one of the pithy gems of the book of Proverbs. Consider the ant, O sluggard. It says in Proverbs 6.6, 6, Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her food in summer and gathers her sustenance in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a vagabond and want like an armed man. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Proverbs, although it is attributed to Solomon. No doubt many Proverbs were building up through the centuries of Hebrew history, and someone brought all of these together at a time later than Solomon. Whoever wrote Proverbs 6, 6 through 11, probably had a lazy, ne'er-do-well son, or nephew, or stepson, or son-in-law. He drove the proverb writer nearly crazy by his behavior. He was venting his displeasure over the indolent oaf by comparing him to the lowly and insignificant ant. 
We've all observed how industrious ants are, going back and forth from their sandy burrows, carrying food particles many times their own size. I once read that ants are the strongest of all the animals on the earth. Frequently, they carry things four times their weight back to their holes in the ground. The writer of this particular proverbial advice was instructing the lazy galoot who prompted the proverb to consider how weak and insignificant the small insect looked, but how strong it was in reality. Consider her ways and be wise. Don't lie in bed all day long or you'll end up a pesky pupper, you lazy lout, ya. Yeah. Both strength and weakness can be deceiving. Some things look very weak, but are actually incredibly strong. Some things look strong, like mastodons or mammoths or saber-toothed tigers, but a group of lowly hunters armed only with sharpened flint spears manage to send these and other large species of animals into extinction. Things are not always as they seem. The Apostle Paul referred to that truth in his second letter to the Corinthians. Throughout his epistles, Paul told us little snippets of information about his personal life. Some of the things he said we wish he hadn't told us, and some of the things he didn't tell us we wish he had. But he said what he said, and in 2 Corinthians 12, we see an example of that. In these verses, Paul's, Paul tells us about himself in the third person. Why? I don't know. He wrote, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Maybe you knew there was a third heaven. I didn't. Anyway, says Paul, the, this Third person man heard and saw things in the third heaven which no one could properly describe. On behalf of this man I will boast, he said, but on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Then Paul tells us about his famous thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan. Scholars have debated for centuries exactly what this thorn in the flesh was. Some say that it may have been an actual physical disability, like polio or diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, while others say it was a psychological infirmity, like post-traumatic stress syndrome, if they knew what PSD, PSTD was, which at that time they didn't. One of my professors in seminary gave the opinion that Paul's thorn in the flesh may have been a very troublesome wife. He made it his business to stay away from her as much as he could, going on long missionary journeys throughout the Mediterranean world on his noble crusade, getting away from his thorn in the flesh. Whatever it was that caused this lifelong problem, Paul said that three times he implored God to remove his affliction from him. But God res God's response was brief and poignantly to the point. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. What a superb and sobering truth that is. When we have weakness of any sort, whether physical or psychological or spiritual, we want to be made strong. But God tells us that his kind of power often is made perfect only through weakness. Not always, not every time, but often. For you see, our dependence on God may be made clear to us only when we incorrectly suppose that we are completely free and independent from God and the need for his strength. To express that in another way, 
we sometimes gain strength only by admitting our many weaknesses. Or, in yet another way, we sometimes learn how strong God is only when we are reminded of how weak we are. In the Broadway musical Les Miserables, one of the resistors of the cruel government and their troops in the plot of the story is a young man named Gavroche. He has a song called Little People. In it he declares that though they are greatly outnumbered and though their weapons are old or faulty or primitive, nevertheless the little people fight like 20 armies and we won't give up. Sometimes the Davids do defeat the Goliaths. Not usually, but sometimes. It happened in the American Revolution. There was no way the Continental Army could defeat the British, but they did. It happened at the Battle of Marathon in Greece when a small band of Greek patriots defeated a huge Persian army in 490 BCE. Was it God's power that was made perfect in the weakness of the American or Greek armies? Probably that's what they thought. In Vietnam, in the Persian Gulf, in Afghanistan and Iraq, the USA was, and in two cases still is, involved in what came to be known as asymmetrical wars. That is, we greatly outnumbered our foes in men, money, and materiel. One of those wars, Vietnam, we clearly lost. The Gulf War we decisively won. And in two of the wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, it is not clear even now more than 17 years later, what ultimately is going to happen. The jury is still out. As citizens of purportedly the most powerful nation in the history of the world, if there is any divine activity when asymmetrical weakness is used against us, is it God who causes that to happen? The armies who defeated us no doubt think so. We have oodles of bombs and shells and bullets, but they were ineffective against IEDs, which cost only a few hundred dollars to construct, but are highly effective in defeating a much stronger enemy. There are millions of people who thought that they were living charmed lives until January of 2020 when the coronavirus struck the world. Now untold numbers of people are living in dis disabling dread. They fear being affected by the virus. Among those who are infected, Probably most are stricken by anxiety over dying. Nonetheless, only 2-3% to of those who are infected actually die from COVID-19. So the chances of dying from it are somewhere between 1 out of 50 or 1 out of 33. Your chances of dying from the usual suspects in the death process heart disease, cancer, other illnesses, accidents, and so on, are far higher than from dying from COVID-19. Never forget that in this time of fear. Still, when people suddenly are confronted by something like a killer virus, they're much more inclined to ask God to intervene in their lives than when they think that life is just a bowl of cherries. So listen carefully, Christian people. In this pandemic, God's power is made perfect in weakness. 
When things appear very dicey to us, we turn to God. God uses our feelings of powerlessness to make His power manifest in us. It is when things might turn out much differently from what we hope that the presence of God becomes the most evident to us. What exactly is the nature of a thorn in the flesh for any of us? If it can be concisely defined, is it an actual apostolic thorn in the flesh, whatever Paul's was? Or might it be a severe case of anxiety or uncertainty or the certain and sudden awareness that we no longer are in control of our lives? In my life, as in everyone's life, there have been many major personal disappointments. But there was one professional disappointment in particular that I'll never forget, but which I also needed resolutely to put behind me. I did not get what I thought I wanted, but as a result of it, I think I was enabled far more effectively than ever before to hear the still sad music of humanity. God's power was made perfect in my weakness, or at least in my inability to engineer what I thought I had always wanted, but which was never to be. Weakness is not limited to physical realities. It also can manifest itself in intellectual, psychological, or moral realities. God's grace is sufficient for all our weaknesses, and His power can be perfected by means of all of them. Weakness need not always assault character. It can also greatly enhance character if we allow God's power to work within us. Sometimes the things for which we are best equipped are the hardest to do, and the things for which we are the least equipped are the easiest to do. Rocket scientists may not figure out how to make rockets go faster or farther, but they can help their neighbors do little things, such as planting a garden or going to the grocery store for them. Complete klutzes who can't fix anything can fix something to eat and take it to someone who is isolated. We too often want to be smart when instead we should choose to be wise. Being smart helps us in the world around us, but being wise helps us in the world within ourselves. God's power is made perfect in wisdom more than in smarts. Raw intelligence is useful in making the world serve us, but wisdom is far more useful in making us serve the world. Too often we misunderstand the nature of power. We presume that power is immediately utilizable as a force or instantly employable authority. God's power frequently is not like that at all. We long to be able to call down the divine Shazam when we get in a pinch, but God almost never uses the divine Shazam. For every crossing of the Red Sea, there are a thousand still small voices, such as Elijah heard in the desert. For every resurrection from the dead, there are a million resurrections of faith, which had turned to ashes, hope, which had crumbled into dust, love, which had grown cold from misuse or disuse. Most miracles are so mundane they are never perceived as miracles. We want flash and dash, but God uses dimmers and glimmers. We want bombs bursting in air, and God uses gentle words, spoken in darkened bedrooms. God's power is made perfect in weakness. Again, not always, not everywhere in everything, but often. Do you want to see the power of God made manifest among us? Then look 
at a newborn baby. I was there when our daughter was born. It was in a 28-room hospital in northern Wisconsin, and the room cost $16 a day. That was a bargain even then, and it was a private room to boot. There were two doctors in that hospital, and they did everything. Internal medicine, neurology, urology, proctology, orthopedics, surgeries, endocrinology, cardiology, gastroenterology, gynecology, obstetrics, podiatry. Everything from top to bottom. Dr. John Telford became a good friend after he delivered our daughter. We had just been in town for a month when Amy was born. He invited me to come into the delivery room, which was not only the delivery room, but the OR and other rooms. I jumped at the opportunity. Six and a half years later, when our son was born in a large Chicago hospital of hundreds of rooms, fathers were not allowed into the delivery room. They were worried about, I suppose, bringing in germs or worried about lawsuits against them if something went wrong. In any event, when Amy entered the world, she did not need a slap on the backside like you see in the movies. The moment she emerged from the birth canal, she realized that where she was was not where she had just been, where it was warm and dark, and she did not much like being in this new environment. She looked quite gooey, but when they cleaned her up, I inspected her closely, and she was amazing. She had everything she should have. Ten fingers, ten toes, two eyes, one nose, one mouth. When I reached out to her hand with my finger, her little fingers gripped it. It was like seeing God in the flesh in the birth of that child. His power was made perfect in her weakness. Babies can't do anything for themselves. But through them, and because of them, we see the mighty power of God, which, besides making the mountains rise, also makes the Amy's live. We can't see that in grown-ups to the degree we can in infants. Only very little people enable us to see God in that unique way. There's great power in weakness. There is great weakness in power. Bombs and shells can't pull it off in the end. Soft words and small deeds will, however. We want to see our Sodoms and Gomorrahs snuffed out in an instant, or the Nile River turned to blood, or the blind to see or the deaf to hear. What we get are millipedes crawling slowly across the sidewalk, or little kids going with their parents to the swimming pool, or cardinals, chickadees, wrens, and nuthatches taking their turns at the bird feeder, or not taking their turns. A few feet beyond the windows I look out of when I am writing sermons, are some holly trees, a magnolia tree, several palmettos, and many, many tall, towering pine trees. I look out from the fourth floor and see nature, red in tooth and claw, every day. Birds fly into the holly tree in the spring, flocks of them, and in a few days, all the berries are gone. Then they fly in only occasionally. Large birds, even 
great blue herons fly through the trees and go to land in the lagoon nearby. This isn't big or flashy. It's small and stolid and splendid. Every day there are new sights. There's divine power in the ever-changing scene, but it is the power of weakness and not a whole lot of strength. God's universe is exceedingly complex, and the world itself is scarcely less complex. The eyes of faith see power in small displays of God as he verifies his power. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said, My power is made perfect in weakness. When weakness is the only medium through which divine power can be made manifest, may God grant us the ability to see what only He can make us see. receive the benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the hollow of his hand. Amen. <laughs>